Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here today and to have the opportunity uh, to talk to you on the future of IP strategy. I'd like to thank the Financial News for providing me with this opportunity. Now, there are several aspects to the future of IP strategy, and I am primarily going to talk on how governments, the courts, and patent attorneys can work together to improve the efficiency and speed of the system to make it fit for purpose in the future. I will give you an overview of the growing number of initiatives in the IP5 offices, the five largest intellectual properties offices of the world, South Korea, China, Japan, the US, and the European patent offices, and amongst the more developed members of WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. In order to have an effective IP system, there needs to be an efficient enforcement system in place to ensure that IP rights are respected. And I will be reviewing some ways of achieving with references to my own experience. Finally, I will look at how patent and trademark attorneys can contribute to the process by working collaboratively with their clients and the patent offices to obtain rights efficiently and cost effectively. It was way back in 1623 that the first statute of monopolies, which is the forerunner of the modern patent system, was introduced in the UK, and letters patents were granted for invention of new manufacturers. The system has successfully adapted over the years, and so far has managed to cope with major technological innovations, for example, biotechnology. But it does take time for the patent offices to recruit new staff to handle patent applications on new technologies. There is no reason why the patent and the IP system in general cannot cope with the continuing pace of innovation and change. I will start by telling you something about the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys, the organization of which I have the honor to be the president. So CEPA is presently celebrating obtaining its Royal Charter 125 years ago. It is about 3,500 members, of which over 2,000 are patent attorneys in active practice. Its members come from both private practice and from industry. CEPA provides education resources, including seminars, webinars, and a monthly journey for its members. It is also very active, representing its members on policy issues at national, European, and international level. It has a good relationship with the European Patent Office and WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and meets with them regularly. It also has close relations with the UK IPO and with UK government departments that deal with IP. Whilst the title of my organization contains the word patents, many of our members also deal with trademarks, designs, and copyright. We also have a sister organization, the Chartered Institute of Trademark Attorneys, whose members also deal with trademark designs and copyright. Between them, UK patent and trademark attorneys contribute in excess of £1 billion to the UK economy each year. Now, much of this comes from representing overseas companies at UK and international level. For example, representing clients before the European Patent Office and the EU IPO, which is the European Trademark and Design Office. The international um, law firm, Taylor Wessing, produced its first Global Patent Index in May 2008. The fifth edition was published in June 2016. The index is based on a worldwide survey of IP owners and users and measures each IP right, patents, trademarks, designs, and copyright in terms of ease of obtaining, exploiting, enforcing, and attacking. In addition, data protection is measured in terms of fairness, enforcement, compliance, and administrative burden and disruption. In 2016, the UK was third overall and first for patents in the Global IP Index. In three of the four earlier surveys, the first, second, and fourth surveys, it was first overall. As well as including the top three jurisdictions, in this chart, I've also included some other countries that might be of interest to you. Japan was 14th overall and 15th for patents. South Korea was 19th overall and 18th for patents. And the US, somewhat surprisingly, was 24th overall and 10th for patents. European countries, and particularly the UK, the Netherlands, and Germany, 
have consistently done well in this survey, so they must be doing something right. I'm now going to talk about um, intellectual property patent office initiatives. The reason for many of the current patent office initiatives can be readily appreciated from this slide, which was obtained from data from the World Intellectual Property Organization. The number of global patent filings is going up rapidly. There was more than a doubling from 2005 to 2015. Much of this increase is due to the rise in patent filings in China, which are now more than one million per annum. This chart shows national patent filings, but the number of filings that are made initially in one country and then filed in other countries, for example, by the Patent Cooperation Treaty route, is similarly increasing. This gives the opportunity and the challenge for patent offices to work together and seek efficiencies by collaborating in search and examination proceedings. This collaboration has taken form of initiatives on two fronts. Procedural harmonization, which was originally led by the trilateral offices, that, that's those from Japan, the US, and the European Patent Office, uh, but has since expanded to include the Korean IP Office, KAIPO, and China's state IP Office, SIPO, to give the so-called IP5 offices. And secondly, we have substantive patent law harmonization. Substantive patent law harmonization is being led by the WIPO B plus group of countries, which includes most European countries, as well as the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Korea. Procedural harmonization. In 2003, industry organizations from Europe, US, and Japan got together as the industry trilateral to discuss how industry could best collaborate with the trilateral offices to improve patent office procedures for the benefit of the applicant and the offices. The group has had regular meetings with the offices since then, and more recently with the IP5 offices. This has led to the Global Dossier Project. Successes have been the common application format, a standardized format for patent applications common to the offices, thus reducing the need for the applicant to incur cost by having to adapt his application from office to office. And secondly, the common citation dossier, a tool to provide a single point access to citation data for examined patent applications across the trilateral offices and since expanded to the IP5 offices. It consolidates the prior art cited by all participating offices for the family members of a patent application, thus enabling the search reports results for the same invention produced by different offices to be visualized on a single page. It is now also possible to access file histories at other IP5 offices by looking on the website for one of the offices. These developments are of great benefit to examiners at the IP5 offices, patent attorneys, and third parties alike. The common citation document and access to file histories are especially valuable for those who want to find out what has happened to a patent or a patent application in each of the IP5 jurisdictions. The next deliverables plan for the Global Dossier Project are to provide enabling alerts, for example, when communications from the patent offices are generated, having documents in XML format, standardizing the applicant's name, which is a project being led by Kaipo, and legal status information. The IP5 offices also set up a group, the Patent Harmonization Expert Panel, to look at issues of patent office practice that industry prioritise for harmonisation. The three initial topics were unit of invention, the offices were inconsistent in relation to deciding whether or not a patent application contained one or more inventions, and accordingly if further patent applications needed to be filed. The citation of prior art, which is an issue before the USPTO and in some re respects before the European Patent Office, and written description, sufficiency of disclosure. This last point concerns how much support the office require for the claims in a patent application. Work is still going on in relation to all these projects. The offices are also initiating a new pilot program on PCT collaborative search and examination. That is to say, a second office relying on the search and examination of the office carrying out the PCT search and examination, with the aim of avoiding repeating what the first office has already done. 
The aim of all these projects is to make the patent examination process more efficient and decrease du duplication when possible. It should also make it easier to grant patents more quickly. All these outcomes are clearly in both the offices and the applicant's interest. However, they may also mean that there will be less work for patent attorneys to do an examination stage in the patenting process. I will discuss how patent attorneys can be of increasing value to their clients later on in my presentation. My presentation has focused on IP5 cooperation in the patents area, but there are also similar initiatives in the trademark and design areas. Substantive patent law harmonization. In July 2011, the USPTO, the Japanese Patent Office, and the European Patent Office along with the UK, Danish, and German patent offices, initiated the so-called Tegensee process to look at the substantive differences in four areas of patent law and find out stakeholders' views on possible harmonisation. After their report, the offices invited the industry trilateral in April 2014 to see if it could come up with a set of proposals from the user's perspective that would enable harmonisation of the laws on these topics. The industry trilateral has been meeting regularly since then and reporting to the offices on progress. The WIPO, B plus group of nations, has also been considering the issue. The four topics are grace period. Europe has resisted the grace period, except for certain limited exceptions, until now on the grounds of legal certainty for third parties. But most other major patent offices, including that of South Korea, have a grace period. China is the other major country without an extensive grace period. Conflicting applications. This refers to whether or not an unpublished patent application is prior art to a later filed unpublished patent application. Here the US has a different system to most other countries. 